Next up, we have AR Space Race revs up. Um, we're going to have Mike Boland be speaking. He's the chief analyst at Artillery Intelligence. Mike is one of the founding uh, tech reporters in Silicon Valley of the Internet Ages at Forbes uh, magazine in 2000. Uh, he's been a tech industry analyst since 2005, and he's the founder and chief analyst of Artillery Intelligence. Um, he's the editor of AR Insider as well, and Mike speaks at conferences such as AWE, VRLA, and AdTech. Um, he contributes to TechCrunch, VentureBeat, um, Business Insider regularly, as well as The New Yorker and Wall Street Journal. Give it up for Mike. So am I, am I on here? Can you guys hear me? Nice. Okay. So thank you for being here. It's great to be here to talk about the space race, and I'll get into what that means in a minute. I'm rearranging here because I like to pace around. Um, so um, I'm going to get into what that means in a minute, but first a quick bit about me for context. Although that was a great introduction already, I can probably just skip this. Um, I'm a 16-year tech industry analyst, most of that time covering mobile throughout the course of the smartphone era, which is going to sort of play in in a bit. Um, before, uh, about six years ago, sort of transitioning over to cover AR and VR exclusively, um, and that includes founding Artillery Intelligence, which, for those unfamiliar, is a market research and analyst firm. Um, that focuses on spatial computing, and that includes lots of typical analyst firm deliverables. It's original market sizing and original um, consumer survey data and narrative reports, and we have a sister publication called AR Insider that we do a lot of this stuff on a daily basis. Um, here, for the sake of disclosure, are the stocks that I own that relate to this topic today. Um, which is always good to disclose, so you can call me out if I'm being biased at any point. Um, so this is our agenda. So we're going to sort of start off by defining what I mean by space race. Um, and then I want to sort of tell this story through the lens of the tech giants that are investing heavily in this area, their approaches, their motivations, um, and sort of tell the story by uh, showing rather than telling. So first off, what is this thing that I'm calling the space race? So this sort of goes back to a editorial series that we do on AR Insider that's sort of ongoing. But going back even further, I got interested in this particular topic because it sort of traces back to my former life as an analyst. As I mentioned, I used to cover mobile and with a particular emphasis on location targeted media and advertising. So that was companies like Foursquare and Yelp and Google with its local SEO efforts. And one of the lessons from that period, excuse me, one of the lessons from that period was that when content or advertising are geo-targeted in any way, they tend to gain value. So one example of that is Google near me searches. So Google searches that are appended with a geographic modifier or the term near me tend to perform better in terms of fetching higher CPCs for Google and getting you know, more clicks and more engagement. So that sort of, the premise is that that location relevance and the value it drives, that whole phenomenon, AR could sort of inherit that in a lot of ways. Um, and the way we see that playing out is so far, some of the manifestations of that principle are walking down the street and holding up your phone to be able to see informational overlays on a storefront or things that if you see like a statue in the park and you want to know the history, these are the things that are starting to materialize through tools like Google Lens and Snap Scan. And I like to think of it as local search 2.0 in that the physical world is indexed with all this geo-anchored data, the same way that the web is indexed by keyword. Um, so there are a lot of ways that this is sort of playing out. And if that sounds familiar, it's very similar. It's an offshoot, or I guess a subset, of the principle of the AR cloud, which is something we've been talking about for years at this conference. The conference's founder, Ori Inbar, coined the term the AR cloud. So it's sort of a, a subset of that larger discussion. Another sort of construct or parallel I like to make is that this is AR's metaverse. Um, metaverse, obviously a hot topic these days, and it's happening in sort of what I like to consider two tracks. The first track being fully virtual, mostly in a VR context. The second track being what we're talking about today, which is digital twins of the physical world that enable AR devices to sort of evoke the right graphics when and where they're relevant. 
Um, and another term that we have for this is the metaverse. And this is something that we sort of beta tested on um, AR Insider in an article we did uh, about a month ago. And it definitely got mixed results. One thing about the metaverse <laughs> that, that you all probably already are familiar with is that people are fired up about it. You know, there are heated debates about, you know, terminology and definitions, which is sort of silly for something that doesn't exist yet. But I do like it because it just indicates the passion for the topic, which, which is a good thing. But anyway, metaverse, I don't know if that's going to actually make it as a term. We sort of beta test. It's a, it's a little clunky. Um, anyway, you get the point. Um, so now kind of transitioning into what all these players are doing to sort of chase this opportunity. And I'll sort of spoiler alert that there's a kind of common theme. They're each doing it for different reasons, but there's a common thread in that they're each trying to protect or future-proof their core businesses. So first, Google, of course, its core business is search. It's become sort of a go-to way to find things local as a, as a Discovery Engine, Google Maps, Google Local, Google My Business. And these are all things that Google has profited, ham profited handsomely from, excuse me, uh, for that same principle I mentioned earlier. When content is targeted locally and when searchers are indicating local intent, those are warm leads for local businesses. And it's really you know, profited from that a lot. So that financial motivation has sort of sat beside and driven a lot of the work that it's doing in this sort of the space race construct. So uh, another way I like to think about this is this is Google's sort of internet of places. So Google created immense value on the web 20 years ago, or starting 20 years ago, by indexing it. It now wants to take that principle and index the physical world and be its sort of organizational layer. And again, we see that playing out with tools such as Google Lens, uh, which is hold your phone up to something and you know it contextualize it, identifies it. And then Google Live View, which is sort of a navigational use case for that same principle. Now, Google is very well positioned in these endeavors because of its, you know, again, 20 years as the world search engine. It has a knowledge graph. It has an image database. It has a rich taxonomy. So its images, for example, Google Images, it can use for object recognition. It's sort of a training set for object recognition for items that you encounter in the real world. And this is sort of what that looks like. You may have already seen this, but this is Google Lens combined with Google Live View and being able to kind of tell information about stores to sort of, you know, aid that sort of consumer journey buying decision in your kind of local commerce endeavors. Um, and I'll also kind of go back to the point about when consumers are nearby in market indicating a certain amount of, amount of immediacy for something they want to do or buy or see locally, that's a really warm lead for advertisers. Google has really sort of jumped on that from a monetization standpoint. That's when users are nearby. If you think about it, this use case, they're not only nearby, but they're in view. So it sort of amplifies that value. And that's another reason why Google's very interested in doing this. Um, so taking that a step further, Google wants to get even more granular. So once you step inside the store, or the restaurant, or whatever the case may be, to find out more information about the products on the shelves, or in this case, menus. Um, and again, Google's data empowers it to do this. So I mentioned its you know, visual database, Google Images, which helps live view, and, and um, Street View helps its, its navigation. With this, it's tapping into Google My Business, which is Google's um, business faces, excuse me, merchant facing portal for them to upload information about themselves. So everything from interior photography to, you know, their hours of operation to their pet friendliness or mask policies. And Google has incentivized this behavior by dangling the carrot of better SEO strength if businesses sort of play ball and upload all their information. And it's so far used this for search, but all of this data, this treasure trove of local business attribution data over years and years and years is gonna really help it to power these sort of visual experiences that are very geographic and local in nature. So moving on to the, the second player we're gonna go over, Apple. It has different motivations than Google, obviously. Its core business is selling hardware. A lot of the things it's doing are sort of plant seeds and pave the road for what's coming next, which you know is, as we all know, or as has been widely rumored, it's AR glasses. So it's doing a lot to sort of um, get things ready, get the world ready for that. And, and I'll get into that in a second, but first sort of as background, panning back, um, Apple has always felt this sort of black eye left over from Mapgate. Do you all remember Mapgate? It was about 10 years ago, Apple Maps came out and it was totally dysfunctional, right? It was like sending people down the wrong one-way streets and it was like, it had the typical sort of Apple front-end polish, 
but it didn't have the data to create an actual functional experience. So they learned that lesson the hard way, and since then they've been like filling in those data gaps through third-party partners, like best-of-breed vertical partners, like Yelp, for example. They work with Yelp for you know, all the data in Apple Maps that has to do with business locations and details and everything like that, and they just do that across the board. But still, they feel that they needed to redeem this. So about three years ago, they decided, okay, we're gonna rebuild the whole thing from the ground up with all first-party data. So they did very Google-like things, like send these vans out on the street to get the first-person perspectives for their kind of version of street view. But they realized, okay, this is sort of a fixed cost. We got all these vans out there. Why don't we sort of leapfrog the technology and future-proof ourselves and capture 3D social maps while we're at it. So they've started to do that in like high traffic, high value areas like commercial districts and they have all these rich 3D maps. And we've only really seen them scratch the surface in terms of what they're doing with that data. So one example is their sort of answer to Google Live View. Just like Google Live View allows you to hold up your phone, it queries the Street View database, so the phone localizes itself and says, okay, we know what we're looking at, we know where we are, and then can overlay the right you know, navigational arrows accordingly. So Apple's doing that with that data set that it's, it's already started to build up. A few other examples. Apple has so many different sort of orbiting parts to its overall sort of AR master plan. GeoAnchors is one where this is a tool within ARKit that allows developers to create geospatial experiences um, and ones that are sort of geo-anchored and persistent. So you leave and you come back and it's still there and it's multi-user so two devices can look at the same thing and it's you know, actually positionally tracked okay. Um, so some of those just sort of table stakes for, for AR functionality, it's built that into GeoAnchors because it wants developers to start to think spatially and start to build things. Uh, Project Gobi is another one I'll mention. I won't go through all of these, but Project Gobi is interesting. They've started to work with um, retail partners, um, like Starbucks, for example, to allow them to place AR activation markers at the point of sale which have various use cases, like unlocking a secret deal, or things that can happen sort of within a store aisle. Um, and again, with all of these, what they're trying to do is sort of you know, uh, pave the roads or plant the seeds for what's coming next, which is their AR glasses, where there's a great, there's a great deal on the line for them with their AR glasses, or I should say their rumored AR glasses. So these glasses, I believe, are gonna be housed within their wearables division, and wearables at Apple in Cupertino are sort of the saving grace. There's a great deal of political capital right now for wearables because they offset some of the declines they're seeing from a maturing smartphone market iPhone revenue has been decelerating for a few years just because they're reaching mar market saturation. So Apple's goal across the board has been revenue diversification, services, wearables, all these other things. So AR glasses will sort of lump in with those, I believe. Therefore, again, there's just a lot on the line. So what they wanna do is, before those get here, they want them to hit the ground running by creating these experiences, by getting developers, again, to start thinking spatially. So those are all the kind of tools they're doing in that sort of Apple long game before those glasses get here. Um, so three um, is Meta, or the company formerly known as Facebook, the artist formerly known as Facebook, I should say. Um, so um, Meta, like what, what are its motivations here? We went over Google and Apple's motivations. Meta's motivations tie back to its core business, which of course is social engagement, that is ad supported in some way, and also its broader sort of metaverse um, ambitions. Um, so it's doing a lot there. Um, and you know, one of the things that, you know, as we went over for, um, excuse me, Apple and, and, and Google, um, they have a lot of assets that help them get there. Facebook, what they want to do is build these sort of spatial maps that then allow them to have um, interactions with the physical world, digital inter interactions with the physical world that sort of deepen connections between people and then between people and businesses in presumably sort of ad-supported and sponsored ways as you might expect for a company like Meta. And their framework for doing this is live maps, or what they call live maps. So it's sort of Facebook's own AR cloud, where they want to build these data sets that are geo-anchored, and again, allow AR devices to evoke relevant graphics where and when um, they come up. Um, and you know, its, it's use cases um, so far involve uh, lots of you know, um, sort of discovery, local discovery um, activations, and 
The, one of the things that this is similar to what I mentioned for Google, because Google is working on its, again, the Internet of Places, and I mentioned some of its benefits in doing so, or its advantages in building that, which is its sort of knowledge graph and all those visual databases. Facebook does not have those things, but one thing it does have is sheer scale. If you consider three billion global users, what it wants to do is sort of crowdsource the construction of these spatial maps from all those users as they sort of move about the world. Now, that sentence should and can and probably does raise a lot of red flags with respect to privacy. So that's going to be the wild card for Facebook in pulling this off, is being able to crowdsource it in those ways, in privacy compliant ways, in ways that have the user trust where people will actually opt into it. Um, and I'll get back to that privacy uh, point in a second, but first, w the way they see this sort of playing out is through a few different layers. So a lot of the AR cloud constructs you're going to hear about sort of lean on this principle of layers. So Facebook is doing this at the base level, you have a location layer, so that's just basically where a building is, the lat long. Uh, the index layer, it gets a little more granular into like the, the um, sort of br blueprints or layouts of a given kind of room or interiors. And then sitting above that is the content layer, which is the more private and permissioned layer of stuff like all your possessions and their whereabouts and where are my keys and things like that. So again, the big question here, if Facebook can pull this off, or Meta, excuse me, if they can pull this off, it's if they can get the world to sort of trust it with this data, like the you know layout of your bedroom. Um, and that's, of course, you know a, a big question mark for a company like Meta. So going back to that crowdsourced approach, though, it's already start, started to sort of step into that territory if you consider its uh, Ray-Ban Stories smart glasses. Now, these aren't going to reach the scale anytime soon to get to where Facebook wants to get in terms of that crowdsourced approach of, of all that spatial mapping. They do have a camera. They do have a first-person perspective, but they don't have the scale to do that. But Facebook isn't really going for that yet. They tend to just work in more of like a long game. So what they want to do at this point, and this is my theory, they're getting those out there to sort of feel out the social mores of AR glasses or of, of camera glasses, of face-worn sensors. How are people adopting them? Um, you know, what are, what are the behaviors? They also want to start to condition the world or to acclimate the world to this type of technology, like Apple, playing that long game before the glasses actually arrive. And for those of you that are familiar with AR glasses and their challenges, there are a few sort of main challenges. One is a pure tech perspective, getting glasses that are sleek enough and stylish enough that people will wear them, but also have a rich enough AR UX um, and graphical intensity and all that. Those two endpoints don't exist in the same device yet, nor will they for a, a few more years. Um, so while that's happening and while that's being hammered out, Facebook also knows that another challenge is going to be cultural acclimation. Will people wear them? So that's what these glasses are doing, is starting to acclimate the world to just wearing sensors on their faces so that when the actual glasses, that other sort of category comes along in earnest, they'll at least be sort of hit the ground running because of some of these efforts. Now, what this gets back to is Facebook's plans to... Um, crowdsource this kind of building of spatial maps because if, and it's a big if, they can have ubiquitous devices that a lot of its users, again, three billion users, um, are wearing. They have a face-worn um, point of view, camera, first-person perspective, and if they reach that level of ubiquity with not only a device that is an access device and a display device, but also a capture device, that will allow them to get there. Uh, but again, I'll reiterate, a lot of ifs, a lot of red flags with Facebook's privacy stuff. They tend to play a long game, so I've, I've maintained some caution optimism that they'll achieve some of that, but a lot of it is going to be worth watching. Um, and then, okay, moving on to the next one, Snap. So Snap has obviously been a consumer AR leader, uh, not just in mon excuse me, not just in um, uh, engagement and traction, but also monetization. Um, its goals and its motivations, just like we went over motivations for all these other players, is sort of similar to Facebook and Meta in that it wants to engender digital experiences in the physical world that sort of deepen social connections and tie back to its revenue, its revenue model, excuse me, which of course is immersive brand advertising. So um, it wants to go about this in, in a few different ways. And another thing that's worth mentioning um, with Snap is that it continues to double down on AR in general. It's really internalized the concept that AR has been the growth engine for its ad business. So it continues to invest in it and continues to double down on it. And through that sort of 
progress progression, there's been an interesting sort of evolution of AR at Snap that we've been observing, which is the transition, or I guess the extension, of AR experiences from the front-facing camera to the rear-facing camera. So not just selfie fodder, uh, but things that augment the broader canvas of the physical world. And the reason that's important is it's gonna create way more use cases, just a broader depth of, of use cases. And as a corollary to that, the types of advertisers that are Snap's addressable market likewise broadens because of all the products that can fit in the physical world, not just the products that fit on your face, like you know, hats, sunglasses, cosmetics, we're talking about higher ticket items, cars, couches, all these other things. So from a business perspective, that's what's really driving it towards AR and towards some of these sort of geo-local AR activations. One example of that is local lenses. So this allows users to augment the world around them um, and sort of create and or experience these geo-anchored sort of um, AR activations in the world around them. The use cases so far are mostly sort of whimsical, digital street art, fun things like that. I believe this is gonna um, evolve into more of a practical utility uh, for sort of seeing things around you, uh, qualifying business decisions, local discovery of, you know, similar to the Google example we saw earlier of, you know, storefront overlays and information. Um, but as it does that, um, it, it's interesting that it, it's already sort of moving in that direction if you can consider Snap Map, which is a non-AR product. But it's sort of the Google uh, Maps. It, it's Google Maps with a social twist. That's the best way to think about Snap Maps. Um, so what it does is it essentially allows um, users to find and discover things around them, um, but with sort of in a social context. Um, where, where have my friends been? Where are they now? What are the things that they've um, recommended in the past? So panning back, I think there's a convergence of these things. So you have Snap Map as this local discovery engine, but once you get to your destination, the ability for it to sort of come alive with things like local lenses. Um, and that could be, again, you know, information on storefronts. It can be you know, what to order at a restaurant, the products on the shelf, um, you know, unlock secret deals, some of the interesting notes my friends have left for me in this location that are unlocked through an AR interface. So um, that's gonna continue to grow. Um, now, one of the things that sort of joins that whole sort of mix of different like local commerce oriented products is Snap Scan. So this is similar to Google Lens, which we saw earlier, and that you can hold your phone up to things and it'll identify and contextualize them and tell you where to buy them. Um, whereas Google, and kind of aligned with its MO of you know, searching all the world's information, Snap Scan, conversely, has more focused use cases that align with Snap's user base and user personas. So that's a lot of sort of fashion orientation or what Snap calls outfit inspiration. So scan what someone's wearing to find out complementary items or the same items and where to buy them. So the point is, I talked about that convergence of Snap Map, local lenses. This sort of joins the mix in interesting ways where all along that consumer journey, you can sort of find things, contextualize them, find out where to buy them. Them, um, and that's gonna continue to drive a lot of Snap's efforts here. So final chapter here is Niantic. So Niantic, just like Snap, has really been a uh, consumer AR leader in general, thanks mostly to Pokemon Go, which has um, created or brought in uh, about five billion in lifetime revenues according to Sensor Tower estimates. But in addition to that sort of commercial success, Pokemon Go has done a few important things for Niantic. And one is sort of sheer scale. So if we go back to some of the spatial mapping methodologies of like Google and Apple, for example, they're piggybacking on their existing sort of mapping efforts. And Facebook, as I mentioned, wants to sort of crowdsource that effort. Niantic similarly wants to crowdsource the construction of spatial maps, but it might have the advantage of more trust from its users in terms of empowering Pokemon Go players as they're kind of wandering the earth playing the game, capturing spatial maps. I like to think of it as the ways of spatial mapping. It's that kind of trade-off. Now that's one thing that it has done, Pokemon Go has done for Niantic. The other one is it's forced Niantic to sort of raise its game with respect to geospatial AR capabilities and surging up to, you know, um, scaling up to surges in, in user demand and activity. And from that, it's really built a solid 
uh, stable architecture and solid platform for geospatial AR experiences. So it decided, wow, this is a valuable thing we've created. Let's spin it out. Let's productize that as its own platform. So enter Lightship, which launched yesterday. You probably already saw. And this takes the game mechanics and the architecture and the, all the learnings from Pokemon Go and bakes them into a platform for third-party developers to just run with. All they have to do is focus on their front-end UX and rely on the foundation that Niantic spent years building the hard way. Now, in addition to like accelerating the AR market, that that's going to do that democratization tool. This is also interesting. And as a side note, from a business perspective for Niantic, this helps it really diversify and de-risk its business model. So again, Pokemon Go has made five billion in lifetime revenues. That's pretty good. But it's done so by sort of defying gravity. So mobile games, as you may know, rarely sustain at those elevated levels for too long. So. A platform now brings sort of a more reliable and recurring revenue stream, it's essentially a SaaS business model, uh, into the mix for Niantic. Um, I like to think of it as AR as a service. So that's a really strong business move for Niantic. And it, in, in that light, it really reminds me of one of the strongest tech products the world has seen in the last decade, which is AWS. It was an internal need. They built it up for an internal need, but then they realized they're sitting on something that could be spun out. And just like AWS sort of democratized you know, a generation of startups to launch and run their businesses, I think Lightship could really have that democratization effect on a lot of AR developers to build some of these really compelling experiences. So I think I'm about out of time. Um, those are all of the kind of companies we're looking at. There are a few others that I've mentioned here. This is going to be a rich ecosystem. It's not just going to be tech giants. We're going to need lots of data. Microsoft is going to be working on the sort of enterprise versions of a lot of the things we just mentioned, digital twins for construction sites and bridge maintenance and everything like that. Um, so it, it's really going to require a lot of things. The last thing I'll say is what I didn't go over, which is this is also going to need sort of a filtration system, right? When all of this geoanchor data populates everything, it's going to be a nightmare if everyone just sees the same thing. It's going to have to be personalized and refined, and that's going to require a filtration system. Um, you know, what's going to be the relevance engine of the spatial web? What's going to be the search engine of the spatial web? What's going to be the Google of the spatial web? It might actually be Google. Um, but anyway, this is going to continue to develop. Um, it's going to be a moving target. We're going to be writing about it on AR Insider. And I'm excited to speak to you all about this topic for months and years because it's really going to develop. Uh, but it just goes back to that location relevance for content. Um, so I'll put a period there. I think I'm out of time. But thank you for listening. Thank you.